we'll be opening up to Hebrews chapter 4. And the only place I plan on going other than Hebrews 4 and 3, 3 and 4, is uh, Revelation. So if you want to go ahead and find Revelation, uh, you can put a pen in chapter 1 there too. We're going to be focusing on in chapter 4, but we're going to start reading in chapter 3, verse 14, and read through 4, 13. So if you will, when you've found your place, stand, and we will read the Word of God. Actually, we'll start in verse 12 of chapter 3. says, Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it's still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm unto the end, while it is, still, while it is said, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. For who provoked him when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that there they were not able to enter because of unbelief. Therefore, let us fear if, while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. For indeed, we have had good news preached to us, just as they also. But the word they heard did not profit them, because it was not united by faith in those who heard. For we who have believed, enter that rest, just as he said, As I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he had said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience, he again fits as a certain day today, saying, Through David, I'm sorry, through David after so long a time, just as has been said before. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works, as God did from his. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest, so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sights, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let's pray. Holy God, may your people hear your word today. And may the ones that are not yours 
uh, the ones that you are going to call to yourself. May it be today that you call them by the hearing of your word. Uh, God, we pray right now that your spirit will be convicting of sin. Uh, God, that it will be uh, piercing even to the deepest, most parts of our thoughts, intentions, our very soul, God. God, we pray, Lord, that you will save today. God, we love you and we thank you. It's in Christ's name that I pray. Amen. I said we're going to focus in chapter 4, uh, but we needed to kind of go back. If you remember the last time I preached, I preached on uh, Hebrews 3, starting in verse 7, and preached through the end of the chapter, but that's not the whole story. The actual, I, don't, I really don't like the break of chapter 4 here. It should have went through at least verse 13, I think. Um, and that's going to be the main points that we talk about today is 4, 1 through 13. Um, but as we were reminded here, um, and just a little recap of Hebrews, Hebrews is written to Christians, but it's of those that came out of the Jewish tradition or the Jewish religion. Okay, it's the Hebrew people, basically, that are our Christians. But all throughout this book, you can see that they are tempted to go back to Judaism. They're, they've placed their hope and trust in Jesus, but things got hard, got tough on them. And you can see where they have kind of been flirting with the idea of going back to Judaism because it's just easier in their culture. So we have this all throughout the book. But today we have even still people that are still flirting with, do I want to really obey Christ? Do I really want to go all the way in with my, my faith and my trust in Jesus Christ? And we're in no different situation here. You know, they believed, they believed in Jesus. They believed in His death and resurrection, but they thought, man, it would just be easier to go back or to not truly continue in obedience to Christ. And I think there's people probably still here, uh, even in, possibly in this room today, that may be there. So I'm going to challenge you today. This is going to be a little off from probably what we're used to at Corinth. But I'm going to challenge you to see, gut check yourself, and see if your obedience matches your belief and vice versa does your belief match your obedience if either of those are not directly coordinated with one another we've got it wrong and what i mean by that is if your works your works should be a result of your faith and your faith should produce your works. When I preached last time, I gave the illustration that faith, belief, whatever you want to call it, and obedience is just two sides of the same coin. We can't do without one or the other. As in the Christian church, I think we've failed in that because we've made uh, what we call easy believism. That all you got to do is just believe, don't worry about it. As long as you believe you're good, go on. That's part of it. But that's not the full good news and the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I want to take a little step back and look uh, all the way back to even Adam today. Just think about it. Um, and think about entering God's rest. Think about Adam. Adam was in the garden, in the presence of God, walking with God, fellowshipping, communion with God. There's no doubt that he believed in God. He experienced Him in his very presence. But yet, once he was disobedient, he no longer enjoyed that rest in the garden and in his presence. Now, go and look at Moses, who the Hebrews would have been like, look, we are followers. Of Mo Moses was our greatest man other than, you know, we got Abraham and Moses, but Moses was the leader. Abraham's the father of faith, but Moses, he is the prophet. Abraham, he's our father of our faith. He's great. 
But Moses was the man. They're like, we follow him. We believed in what Mo Moses had done, but yet in the wilderness we have the presence of God by cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And yet they did not enter Canaan, promised land, which is not the rest that we're looking to achieve as in a place here on earth. Uh, and in this text, I believe it is talking about a uh, Sabbath rest, not just a, uh, a place here on earth that we can finally say, hey, we've made it. Uh, it is an eternal rest. But I want you to be sure that you are in that rest this morning. And if Adam or if the people of Moses who had watched the Egyptians drown, they had seen evidence of God. They had been with His presence day and night. They knew there was a God. They even followed a lot of what God told them to do. But yet their disobedience caused them to not enter that rest. So if they can't be sure of it, I want you to say, am I sure of it? That's the challenge this morning. Are you sure that you are in the rest of God? So look at Hebrews uh, chapter 4. We'll start uh, chapter 4 and go to verse 1. It says, therefore, let us fear if, while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. So what it's saying is, there is a reason to be feared, or to fear, if there's still a promise of rest, because there's a chance we may not be in it. You should be fearful. Before a holy God has given you, He has swore that there would be a rest. How can we be sure that we're in it? And you better be fearful that you are remaining in that rest. That, because it says, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. Now, if you're in fearful or if you're in fear this morning that you may end up um, or you're not sure about where you may end up when you die for all eternity, that's good. You should be. That's what the text tells us. You should be fearful. That's a good thing. Because Scripture also says you should fear God because He's the one that can destroy not only your body, but your soul for all eternity. That is something to be feared. And here we have not only the individual person that should fear, but it says, let us fear if. While a promise remains of entering His rest, and that still is the case, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. So once again, like we talked back in last time I preached in chapter 3 of Hebrews, in verse 12 where it said, Take care, brethren, that any of you... Same thing here. We should be fearful that any one of us may not be entering that rest. It's not just an individual thing. We're here as a body. We're here to make sure that everyone understands what truth is. Everyone understands what the Word of God says about entering His wrath or entering His rest. Once again, it's not just a one-time, one-person situation. It is a call for the entire people that's under the hearing of Hebrews, to make sure that any one of us enter that rest. Now, verse 2, it says, For indeed, um, for indeed we have had good news preached to us, 
just as they also. But the word they heard did not profit them, because it was not united by faith in those who heard. Now, a lot of people want to jump and change this good news into the gospel. I would say hold off. Don't. I know that's how we normally translate the good news, but I would dare say that probably the people in the wilderness didn't have an understanding of Jesus Christ being crucified, being buried, and resurrected. But what did they have the good news of? They had the good news of the promise of God's rest, just like we have it today. Now, we know it by the means of grace and through the works of Jesus Christ in His death, burial, and resurrection. We do know that, but let's don't jump ahead and say, oh, that's just the, the good news, the gospel. Okay, But the people of the Old Testament had it, and we have it. We've heard it. If you've been here long at all, at least in this church, you've heard the gospel. You've heard the good news of God. But that's not enough. It's not enough. Hearing it doesn't get it. Now, if the Word of God isn't met with faith to trust in it, then this book is just a really good fictional book. That's all it is. It's truth. I've heard it. I know what it says. But if it doesn't meet with faith, it's just a simple book. It's not the Word of God. Faith has to come with the hearing of the Word of God. So those people that had heard it, it's like those bodies in verse, thir- or verse 17 of chapter 3. What happened to those that simply heard it? Second part of it, whose bodies fell in the wilderness. It was those who sinned, had walked in the wilderness, being guided by God the whole time, by Moses, and yet did not enter His rest. They heard it. They knew. They knew God. They even followed some of His. They followed His guidance. They followed His way, but it wasn't met with faith. This reminds me of the old illustration of a uh, a boxing match where. They uh, go out there, they have their names called out. The first guy does his little motion and returns back to his ring. And then the next guy comes out there and he does the whole cross thing and does his little motion and returns back to the ring. And the guy in the other corner says, hey, what does that mean? What does that little motion mean? He said, it don't mean anything if you can't fight. It doesn't. Knowing the Word of God doesn't mean a single thing if you've not placed your hope, trust, everything in it. It's just a fiction, just a really good non-fiction book. I mean, it's truth. It's history. All that type of stuff. You can even claim it to be truth. Yet if it's not met by faith and obedience, what good is it? What good is it at all? Verse 3. Chapter 4 says, For we who have believed enter that rest, just as he has said. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. Verse 4 says, For he has said some work concerning the seventh day, I can, I can relate to the Hebrews writer. Somewhere it said, well, come on, dude, Genesis is pretty obvious. You could kind of relate it back to Genesis. But he just says, ah, somewhere it was written concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, And those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience. He again fits as a certain day today, saying through David, 
after so long a time, just as has been said beforehand. So we had looked at um, Psalms 95, where some of this comes out of, the last time. But I want you to look in verse 6. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter. God has decreed that there will be some to enter. There's going to be some. It is a decree of God. Now, let's think about this. God says there's going to be some to enter. I'm done. I've rested. Creation's done. I'm, I've rested. I'm done with it. We see Moses and the people of Israel, or the Hebrew people, didn't enter it. Some did. The children entered promised land. That was the promise that they had been given. But yet, that wasn't the rest that God intended. They were to rest. They was going to have peace, land flowing of milk and honey. It was going to be great. But even once they got there, the children, they were disobedient. And because of their disobedience, because they didn't do what God called them to do, they had war and strife all throughout the time that they were in the promised land. Why? Because of disobedience. They didn't enter the rest that God had intended for them because of disobedience. Now, if God does something and says, I'm going to rest, and there are going to be some that enter my rest, it's going to take place. It's going to happen. Okay? God doesn't just do stuff that doesn't matter. That God say, okay, yeah, I'm just kidding with that. Not, let's forget that. Let's move on to something else. If God did it, it means something. And God entered His rest with the intent of some to enter it. It's going to be some. Now you say, well, the Israelites didn't enter it. How can we be sure that we're going to enter it? Is there a chance for us to enter it? Because you've got to think now, if, when this was written uh, to the people and was read by the people, the Hebrew people here, they've got to be thinking, look, we missed out on the promised land, the rest there. Now we've been given the Messiah and we've completely disregarded Him. We've murdered the Son of God, the Messiah. Is there any hope for us to have rest as the people of Israel? Has God not finally shunned us once and for all for that? Well, verse 7, He again fixes a certain day. And when is that? Today. That's it today, saying through David, after so long a time, just as has been said before, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So David, this is, you know, David's after the Israelite people or the Hebrew people in the desert, Joshua after all them. He's still proclaiming, today you can enter his rest. And today, just as David would have preached it, or talked sang about it, whatever he did, just like the Hebrew writer penned this thousands of years ago, it's still today. Grace is still extended today. You say, well, what about tomorrow? There's no mention of that. Not the first word mentioned of tomorrow. It's today. It's here and now. You need to be certain. Not that you will, but you have entered His rest. Verse 3 says, For we who have believed enter that rest. We've done it if we believed. But wait a second. You've been talking about belief and obedience and all that type of stuff. You're right. You are right. Because I want you to be sure. How do you be sure? I want you to know what the Word of God says about 
your belief. You say, well, I believe, I believe, I believe that I believe, but is it the belief and the belief that the Word of God explains as those who having it have entered His rest? Look in verse 8. For if Joshua had given them rest, well, if we just make it into the promised land, we'll have that rest, right? That's all, we believe that. He would not have spoken of another day after that. Well, what do you mean by that? That rest was not this Sabbath rest that we're talking about. Because remember, we've got the example here of God finishing His work, and He rested. Our work's not finished here. We still have work to do here. So it's not, oh, once we believe, we're good. We're, we're in the rest, we can coast on out of here, right? No, we haven't entered that rest completely yet. Now, I do want you to say, or to understand that yes, I believe 100% that it is of faith, and that is a gift of God. That's how salvation comes about. But that is the type of belief and faith that Scripture tells us. It is not just simply a, oh, I believe that's what the Word of God says. That's great. That's good. Once again, you should believe that's what it says. But do you believe it down to your ever innermost parts of your body? Just think about Adam. Adam had it. He was in the garden. And yet, he loses it because of disobedience. So you're saying if I disobey one time, I'm done, I will not enter that rest? Once again, the Scriptures will tell you what that belief looks like. Don't let somebody tell you, oh, well, and we've got them around here. Oh, you, you messed up that one time, you're done. There's no hope for you anymore. You said you believe, now you've been disobedient. Sorry. That's not the belief and the faith that Christ and His works uh, that we have in that. So, verse 9 says, So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Now this is actually uh, the first time this word rest means the Sabbath rest. Okay? But I think the other times when it mentions the rest, it's leading up to this one Sabbath rest. Okay? Because yes, once we believe, we rest in the work of Jesus Christ. We rest in the hope in Jesus Christ. We rest in God's Word. We, we do rest. That is a type of rest. But I think it's all leading up to this Sabbath rest that it mentions here in verse 9. Verse 10 says, For the one who has entered, past tense, entered his rest, has himself also rested from his works, as God did from his. So if you've believed, you have entered that rest. Okay? You yourself have finally sat down and said, God, I'm done. I'm tired of trying to make it on my own. I realize I cannot be right with you in my own doings. What you say is truth. I believe in your son's work for my salvation. I'm finally done with trying to do it on my own. And that's a good rest to be in. It's that type of rest that will lead to this Sabbath rest. So there is the Sabbath rest for some. There is the rest for some. Now, here comes those little bit harder verses. Verse 11. Chapter 4, verse 11 says, Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest, so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. Let us be diligent. But wait a second. Old preacher said, if I just pray this prayer, 
then I'm good. Well, that's not being real diligent about anything, is it? That's a simple one and done type deal. What are you talking about being diligent? Well, I wrote it down the date that I believed in my Bible, so I'm, I'm good. I still got it. Like it's some ticket to entrance to God. Say, nope, I got my ticket. I'm good. How foolish. God forbid that we can think that we've done something to enter God's rest. We've done nothing. But I also hope and pray, and God would forbid it, that we would simply think all we have to do is this easy believism of believing, yep, Jesus died on the cross, I'm good. That never matches up in the Scripture here. If that is not coupled with our obedience to Him, Scripture says that belief, that faith, it's dead. That's not the faith that we're talking about. A simple head knowledge of Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins, that's not the faith we're talking about. If it's not paired with obedience to the King, we've got it mixed up somewhere. And once again, I'll say, I believe 100% that salvation, faith, belief, all that is a gift from God, and it's not of any of our works that no man should boast. Our salvation is not based on our works or our, even our, just our obedience. If we say, well, I can sit down and I can follow the Ten Commandments. I cannot, you know, murder, cheat on my wife, all those type things. I can do that. But just like Jesus come and said, guys, you've already done that. It's not the actions that's going to cause you to go to hell. It's your evil heart where you have hated a brother or where you've looked at a woman lustfully. You're done. You're done for. You're evil. I also believe that 100% that if it's the faith and belief that Scripture explains and tells us about, it will 100% be accompanied by obedience. And God's work in conforming us into the image of His Son will be completed. And it's that type of belief and faith here that the Scriptures are talking about. Because just like in verse 11, Therefore, let... Uh, yeah, chapter 4, verse 11. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest. Well, what do you mean? What do you mean by being diligent? I believe. That's all it takes is belief. You're right, but you need to be sure that you're going to enter that. Be sure that your belief lines up with that of Scripture, and if it does, you'll be diligent. How? So that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. So if you truly believe, you're going to follow in obedience. As to not fall into disobedience and to miss out on the rest of God. So if you truly trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and He is who He says He is, and God is who He says He is, then you won't only believe that, you'll be obedient to Him in everything that He says. Now, is that going to take place at belief? As soon as we have that gift of faith given to us, are we going to be completely obedient to Christ? No. There's only one obedient. <coughs> Jesus Christ was the only one that was 100% obedient to God the Father. But guess what? That evil heart in you at the point of belief will be turned to, I want to obey. I want to not only trust, but I want to obey God and live according to His Word. So now then, I will say this. If you don't have any evidence of your obedience, your commitment to Christ, other than a simple, hey, I believed one time in Bible school, I prayed this prayer. Hey, I know the ABCs of faith. That's not being diligent in entering the rest. You ought to be diligent. To be as sure of your belief is the belief that is what Scripture calls belief. In that, you will 
be obedient to the Father, just as Christ was obedient to the Father. That's the only way we can be sure that we are going to rest in God. Now, the really scary parts of the Scripture. So how can you be so sure, Cody? Well, y'all can't look at me and tell. Okay? But what can? Verse 12, For the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You say, well, you don't have much works. I sure hope I got some, though. Well, how can we be so sure that your heart's right? You can't. I can fool you. I'm a good liar. I was born that way. I've had a lot of experience at it. But guess what? It doesn't matter what you think because God knows. God's Spirit, His Word, it, if God's Spirit's in you and His Word pierces through you to check and see if that Spirit's in you, He'll know. There's no creature, verse 13, hidden from His sight but all things are open and laid bare to him, to the eyes of Him whom we have to do. It is God Almighty that's going to be the judge. He's the one. Well, if He's going to judge, what's the criteria? It's His Word. What does His Word say? You might say, well, yeah, well, look at my works. I've done this, 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 and this. Once again, without faith, there's no rest. You're just busy. You weren't being obedient. You're just being busy. You may say, but I'm a genuinely good person. Look at everybody else. I'm pretty good. By man's standards, you probably are. But the Word of God will judge deep down into your deepest, darkest parts. Because we can put on a show for people. We can say, I need to go do this. Because, hey... It's going to look good. High school kids are the best at it. They'll go do anything to put on their applications to colleges. It don't matter what it is. They'll do it because they need to look good in front of them. And I feel like sometimes we do that too. We say, hey, I need to go do this. I need to get some brownie points with God. I need to kind of let Him know I'm still here type deal. Is that diligent? Is that being sure to enter that rest? And here's the thing. I know you're sitting up here saying, well, you're the one up here telling us what God says, and that's one of the scariest things that entered my thought this week. I've, I fear that the vast majority, when I say the vast majority of pe anybody that has ever walked the face of the earth, I mean like 99.9% .9 of mankind probably has just took somebody else's word for who God says He is. Like maybe some of you do every week, come in here and listen to Joey, and you take his word for what God says, or you take my word, or you took your parents' words or your grandparents' words, just to say, well, they told me that if I just do this, I'm good. That's the scariest thing uh, to me. We should only trust in the Word of God not of any man what He's told us, because it's all of eternities. All of your eternity is what's at stake. Your eternity is either going to spend under the wrath of God or it's going to be spent in the rest of God. And you're going to leave it up to some fool on TV to tell you what God says in His Word. Or that fool standing before you this morning... You better be diligent. And that means you better be getting into God's Word and seeing what God Almighty has said Himself. Don't take my word for it. Don't take Brother Joey's word for it. You better make sure it's what the Word of God says. And just to make you feel a little bit better about yourself, go ahead and turn on to Revelation 1.
Guys, don't think you can put on some mask and fake it till you make it. It's not working with God. Revelation 1, verse 16. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. His word, sharper than two-edged sword. Look at chapter 2, verse 16. Chapter 2, verse 16 says, Therefore repent, or else I am coming to you quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. Flip on over to 19, chapter 19, verse 15. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. Same chapter, verse 21, I'm sorry. Very last verse in that chapter. And the rest were killed with the sword which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. See, the Word of God, what I tell you about be, your belief and your disobedience or your obedience, what word, the Word of God says is great for some, those that enter His rest. But for those of us that it doesn't match up our belief and our obedience, it should be terrifying. No wonder He says, fear. There should be a great fear when our lives don't line up with the Word of God. And it should be even a greater fear when our salvation that we think we have doesn't line up with what the Word of God says. We need to be in fear for one of two things. Either one, you personally, you personally don't know the rest of God. You've not entered that rest of God. And two, for us that have, there's people we know that have it. And today's the day. We've got no promises of tomorrow. Today's the only day of salvation. Now, we're about to enter a time of praise and worship, and we should absolutely praise God for being able to, having the opportunity to enter His rest. But if you believe in what the Word of God says about entering His rest, or if you don't see obedience matching with your belief, or if you don't see belief matching your works, you need to cry out to God for salvation. There's no, oh, I like the belief part, or I bet I can be good enough part. Once again, it's the different sides of the same coin. And it's according to what God has said. Today is what He says. If you're unsettled about anything that the Word of God in this text has said, I would. this is a little bit odd part. I told you I was going to challenge you to. You need to be doing business right now in your own hearts. But if you're not settled in it, as we enter this time of praise and worship, you need to cry out to God. Or if you don't understand what's really been said this morning, you need to grab Brother Joey or me or somebody that you've got confidence in, and you better get it settled today. That's the only chance that you're promised is today. And the great thing about it is, if you're still in Hebrews chapter 4, look, here's your hope. We didn't get to it. It's very weird to not get to it, but 
time's sake, I'm not going to go into all of it. Chapter 4, verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. If we do not have a high pri- or for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. It's, guys, you may believe, but you are not necessarily living up to what God would call obedience to Him. We have a great high priest you can go to. We can go to Jesus at any time. You don't think He might have struggled with obedience sometime? Look at Him in the Garden of Gethsemane, crying out, God, if there is any other way, I know the way that you have for me, but if there is any other way than the cross, but if there's not, I'm willing to do it. That's the same God that even when we find ourselves in sin as a believer, we still can cry out to Him. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And the time of need is today. Let's pray.